Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this first talk on day two of DockerCom. I hope you had a great time. My name is Gabriel. I am working for the training team at Docker. And as such, I'm, of course, very, very interested in this first talk because I will have to write about these things. Um, with me, I have John Stark. He is the principal engineering lead at Microsoft, and he is going to talk about Linux container on Windows. Wow. <laughs> Take it away. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, so first, just a little bit more about myself. Um, so I am uh, one of the container architects on the, uh, in the Windows team at Microsoft. Uh, and I've been working for a little while now on um, Windows uh, containers, Windows Server containers, um, and uh, the integration work in Docker and Containerd to make that happen. And um, recently, I've been focusing a lot more on on Linux because actually I'm the principal engineering lead for the Linux on Windows team. And uh, what we do is try to make sure that uh, Windows really is the one of the best places for you to. Uh, develop Linux code, and even deploy Linux code. And so we work on uh, Linux VM technologies. We work on the uh, Windows subsystem for Linux, which allows you to run uh, Linux binaries natively on uh, the Windows kernel without a VM at all. And of course, we, we're continuing to do work in Docker, and now we've got this, uh, this new Linux containers on Windows feature that we've, we've added to the latest release of Windows and uh, are actively integrated into Docker uh, as we speak. Um, but today I'm just going to focus on this latest thing, Linux containers on Windows. And you might say, well, you know, why, do we, why are we building something new called this? Because we already have Linux containers on Windows. We already have Docker for Windows. Um, and Docker, Win Docker for Windows is great. Uh, it allows you to run uh, you know, existing Linux containers it, um, on Windows for development purposes. You know, it creates a, a, a kind of a Linux VM uh, classic style when, uh, Linux VM manages it for you and gives you kind of the familiar set of Docker tools to be able to uh, create containers, do Docker build, all that kind of thing. Um, but there's a, there's a couple of limitations about Docker for Windows that doesn't really make it ideal. One is uh, you can't use Linux containers and Windows containers at the same time. There's this, there's this big mode switch where we, we go from this Linux container mode to uh, the kind of native Windows container uh, functionality that's built into Windows. And the second issue is it's really just for development. And we wanted something that you can, if you have Windows, uh, Windows Server VM or Windows Server host, you can just run Linux containers directly on that machine without having to, um, you know, w without having to manage your own separate Linux VM or something like that. And so, of course, you can just use a Linux VM yourself and, and lose that integration that Docker for Windows gives you. Um, and uh, you know this is sort of Linux containers on Windows, right? But um, you know again, it doesn't give you that single daemon experience of being able to single Docker daemon that can run Windows and Linux containers together. And then uh, we've gotten a lot of questions about whether we should support running Docker directly in the Windows subsystem for Linux, because hey, we've we've implemented the the Linux Syscall ABI. Uh, Docker is a Linux application. Uh, why can't we just run Docker directly? Well, don't tell anybody, but actually you can with the latest Windows release, uh, with the latest Insider builds, I should say. It is possible. Uh, you can go try it out if you like. But there's a few limitations here. Uh, one is that you know, WSL, Windows Subsystem for Linux, is really intended as, as kind of a, a mechanism to run Linux developer tools on Windows to do scripting, uh, some basic automation, things like that. But it's not really intended for use in production. So it doesn't solve that first problem, that first limitation of Docker for Windows, uh, that, that you can't, you know, you can use it on your dev box, but you can't use it really on Windows Server. It's available on Windows Server for, again, automation, scripting, that kind of thing. But it's not appropriate for running, uh, currently not appropriate for running, you know, production web servers, things like that. Um, the second problem we have is that, uh, although, you know, we, we've put a lot of love into WSL, and I, I spent all last week working on getting like the latest, or getting some additional um, flags to the clone syscall working. So, I, you know, I, I love it. I love working on it. 
but um, it has some rough edges in some of the areas that uh, really need to be pretty polished for Docker. So the networking support, um, you know, around IP tables and things like that doesn't quite work out. And uh, some of our file system performance is uh, rather, you know, we've, we've got some performance issues to kind of work through before it's really fast enough for some of these uh, Docker workloads. So, so WCL is not really ready for, for running Docker and, and, and that being a, a really good experience. Uh, so that brings us to uh, LCAL, or Linux Containers on Windows, which is this latest project. And uh, before I go into the architecture, I think we should just see a quick demo of this. So what I have here is um, I'm running a, a almost Docker master. There's one extra uh, PR that we haven't gotten merged yet, but this is basically Docker master. And this is the Windows 10 Fall Creators update that was released uh, yesterday. And in here I've got, uh, I've already loaded some images up. And immediately I think this is pretty cool. At the top here we've got the, the Microsoft Nano server image. That's our, our small Windows server uh, base image. But then I've got three uh, Linux images, the same daemon. And I can uh, run these things. Uh, uh, da -da -da. Oops. So I can, you know, I can run both. There's no mode switches. There's nothing like that. So here's the Windows container running. And here's, uh, let's run an Alpine image. And great, Windows containers, Linux containers. Uh, and just for fun, let's also run uh, Yoncat. Let's get that running. And uh, we'll let the cat kind of wear itself out and come back to that in a few minutes. So, um, so how did this work? What's the basic architecture? So f first, let's just take a, a quick look at the um, you know, very familiar components of Linux containers on Linux, which I call LCAL, but I don't think that's going to uh, catch on. But um, so we've got, some, we've got a few pieces here. I, I've simplified this dramatically, of course. So there's Docker D, uh, Container D, uh, kind of providing the, the lower level um, uh, you know, container system management. And when you actually launch a container through Docker D and then th through Container D, it launches a run C process, passes as an OCI specification, runtime specification. And I, that's what actually creates that uh, process in this new set of Linux namespaces. And this is all running on a shared Linux kernel. So if you have multiple containers, they're all going to share the same kernel. You know, this is basic stuff. Uh, so when we came to do uh, LCAL, uh, Linux containers on Windows, we wanted to preserve as much of this architecture as we could and reuse all the same components, but just kind of extend it to work uh, on a Windows host. And so what we've done here is I've kind of exploded this out and we've added uh, hardware virtualization. We've added VMs. So you can see here, uh, the green boxes are all the same, but these kind of gold colored boxes are the new components. And at the bottom we have the, the Microsoft Windows hypervisor. There's the Windows kernel on the left. So this is the Windows host, essentially, uh, on the left side. And on the right we have a Linux VM. So we've got this new uh, Windows kernel. On the left side, running as Windows services, we still have Docker D, we still have Container D, um, but Container D is now calling into HCS, which is what we call, uh, which is the host compute service. This is a service in Windows um, that we developed initially for Windows containers, but it essentially manages running VMs and containers on the on the Microsoft uh, on the Windows container and Hyper-V stack. So. Uh, so if you've, if you've seen talks about how uh, Windows containers are implemented, you'll, HCS should be familiar. This is the same component that Docker D or Container D call into to run Windows containers. Um, now back on the, on the Linux VM side, we have a component called GCS, which is Guest Compute Service. This is essentially just HCS's buddy over in the, uh, in the Linux VM to be able to act as kind of a proxy for things that the HCS wants to do. So when, you create a, when I created that Linux container uh, a few moments ago, what actually happened was that, um, and I'm cheating a little bit, we don't actually have container D in this picture right now. That'll come in a, probably in a month or two. But uh, essentially, we're calling down into HCS. HCS is very quickly creating that Linux VM, booting it up, 
launching the GCS inside of it, and then sending a message across uh, kind of a VM transport to the GCS to launch run C and, and launch the, the container as usual. So we're sending the same OCI runtime spec across. HCS and GCS actually don't even really know anything about that spec. It's just kind of a pass-through. And so we're reusing all that, that uh, existing technology that had been developed for uh, standard Linux containers. Uh, the other thing I want to point out is I've only drawn one uh, container in this picture. If you have multiple containers today, each of those are going to be a separate VM. And this is in contrast to something like Docker for Windows, where there's just one big VM that, that hosts all the containers. Uh, we think that um, we can actually get the performance good enough that that's acceptable, but we also see probably some value uh, in the longer term of being able to run multiple containers in a single um, VM instance. So uh, that's something that we're definitely looking into. Uh, but I know what you're thinking, like, okay, well, now we've got this VM, surely this is this heavyweight thing, it's a, uh, you know, maybe I have to manage it or something like that. Uh, but this, we've really tried hard to make sure that's not the case. And the, so, so we've termed this type of VM that we, we launched for this thing a utility VM. This, again, is maybe familiar technology, or familiar terminology if you've uh, looked into how Hyper-V isolated Windows containers works. This is essentially a Hyper-V isolated Linux container. And what that means is that utility VM that we launch, is, it's fresh each time. It's, it's uh, a stateless VM. Uh, the root file system is immutable. It's read only, mounted read-only. Every time you start a container, we create a new instance of that VM. So there's no state that gets left behind or gets committed in any images or anything. It's, it's um, stateless in that way. And you know, again, we've worked hard to make sure that the um, the payload in that VM is as small as possible. So we don't need much uh, in, in the way of kernel modules and things because the hardware is always exactly the same. It's the same virtual hardware. And the root file system for thing, this thing really just needs to be enough to launch GCS, to launch run C. And there's a few other little miscellaneous tools that we have to throw in. The VM itself is, uh, if you're familiar with Hyper-V on Windows, it's based on uh, what we call a generation two VM. It's a legacy free VM. We don't have any of the familiar, there's no VGA, there's no PCI. It's just uh, these synthetic devices on this, uh, the VM bus uh, virtualization um, transport. And so that allows us to cut down on some of the, the kernel boot time and some memory use. And then finally, if you've used Hyper-V before and you've, you've launched a VM, you know that it statically consumes you know, a few gigabytes of RAM for each VM, how, however much RAM you configure the VM for. And if you go and try to, you know, open a bunch of browser tabs or, or play a game or something like that, uh, or open Visual Studio, this can be really frustrating because, you know, the, the VM doesn't participate in paging uh, decisions for the, uh, that the, the host memory manager might make. With utility VMs, that's not the case. The, the memory is actually just like any other application memory. So it can be paged, it can be compressed, it can be deduplicated, all that kind of thing. Um, but if you're still not convinced, I, I want to go in a little bit more why, v, you know, why VMs, and uh, you know, why didn't we use WSL? So reiterating that the, uh, the WSL is not really designed for production, it's not complete. You know, I just added clone VM support last week. So if you, you know, if you really want to be sure of, of, um, that your Linux software is running the same when you're testing it on your dev box and then when you go to production, you want to make sure you're running the real Linux kernel on your dev box. And we think that eventually maybe we'll get there with WSL, that the compatibility will be good enough, we could even certify it, maybe. But certainly for now, the Linux kernel is, is the best at running Linux software. Uh, we've already talked about production use. And uh, finally, isolation. So there's a, you know, been a lot of debate on whether a shared kernel approach uh, is sufficient for something like multi-tenant isolation. And uh, at Microsoft, we're really betting on the virtual, hardware virtualization to give us this capability instead of a, a shared kernel approach. It's something that we're already doing in Azure. We already rely on the VM boundary being solid uh, to protect our customers, to protect our data centers. So we thought, well, let's, let's reuse that, uh, those investments uh, with Linux containers. So uh, quickly, we'll come back to our uh, Nyan cat here. Um, and what we're going to do, so it's actually still running. I hit Control-C. Um, what we're going to do is, is uh, look into this VM a little bit more. So we can see it's still running. There's um, this container ID here. Uh, 
And I want to introduce a tool that you may not be familiar with uh, that's inbox in Windows called HCS Diag. It's a diagnostics tool for anything that's launched through the HCS. So it works on Windows containers, it works on Linux containers, even works a little bit on uh, VMs. And what we can see here is that uh, with HCS Diag list, we can see this uh, container template. This is related to the Windows container I launched earlier. Don't worry about that guy. But uh, this one here is the, our Linux container. So it, um, it's actually an entity that HCS knows about because it's running. And uh, HCS Diag gives us a few commands that we can use to kind of interact with the, the container without Docker knowing about it. Some of this is useful. Uh, it's not as useful with Docker. For example, I can, I can use um, the exec command, which is kind of like uh, Docker exec. Why would I do that? I have Docker exec. Maybe that's not so useful. Um, but uh, what is useful is I can actually interact with that utility VM, which is something that Docker doesn't expose. So here I'm using the console command with dash UVM for utility VM. This allows me to uh, actually get a, um, a shell into the utility VM itself. And I just want to show you the process list here where uh, we can see that uh, GCS is indeed running, as I mentioned. And then if we scroll down here, there's, there's Run C, and of course Run C has launched Neoncat. So you can kind of use this to, if you're, to, to learn more about the system or to diagnose problems. We use it a lot in development uh, when things go wrong. Uh, the other thing I want to show you is the task manager for this thing. So the container's still running. Um, let me sort by name here. I just want to show you the, the processes that cr get created when you launch one of these things. So um, for every VM on the Hyper-V based stack, we have this worker process that runs. This is the thing that actually hosts some of the devices and things like that. Um, and there's two of them here. One of them is that template thing again. Don't worry about that guy. But uh, uh, so this, this one here is actually the worker process for our Linux container. And then corresponding to that is going to be a, a memory process. This is actually what hosts that pageable uh, VM memory I mentioned. So we can see here, right now, this is a little fatter than I'd like it to be. It takes 160 megs to, to, to run Yoncat. Um, we can do better, but, but it's actually, uh, I think, fairly good uh, overhead compared to running a whole VM where you know, immediately you're consuming two gigs or whatever. Uh, so if you want to know, you know, which, uh, if, you know, how do I know which worker process is which, this is a little bit of a pain. Uh, one trick is you can just start killing them until your container dies. And that's the right one. Uh, actually, I, I think that, you know, as I was preparing for this, I realized we should just add that to HCS Diag so it's easy to, to figure out which, which worker process is which. Uh, so maybe next release, we'll, we'll get that in. Um, so, great. So we've, we've talked about kind of the basic architecture. We've, we've got this VM. How did this VM boot? What did, where did this file system and kernel come from? So uh, the... Basic idea is we're not going to, you know, we don't ship this stuff in box in Windows, of course. And, and the hope would be that once this is available in, in either maybe Docker for Windows is updated to use this technology or uh, it's available in, in, in some other Docker products that a kernel and, and, an, and a root file system for that VM will, will be shipped with that. But if you're doing development or you want to replace this stuff or play around with it, you have to kind of provide your own. Uh, so the idea is that the kernel is basically standard. There's a few uh, patches that haven't made it upstream yet. We're uh, basically to fix some bugs in the Hyper-V drivers. Uh, we're actively working to get those upstream right now. And we've documented the kconfig that uh, we recommend, and you can tweak it further. It's on our GitHub repo for that GCS component, uh, which I forgot to mention is the GCS side, at least, is open source. Um, and, so, uh, and then for the file system itself, we support either NRD, um, which is really convenient to build, but has but has to be decompressed and loaded into memory and things uh, during boot. Or you can just give us a file system image, and we can actually use that directly. Um, but it's a little more, a little less convenient to construct. Uh, that file system in, image, as I mentioned, just contains a minimal init process, GCS, Run C tools, uh, some basic tools. And if, you've, if you watched uh, Rolf's talk yesterday on Linux Kit, you know that, well, this is, this is basically what Linux Kit was made for, is constructing these images in this way. So this is the, the, definitely the best way to construct these. Use Linux Kit. If you haven't seen the talk, check it out. Um, should be available uh, once they release all the talks. Uh, 
Um, so uh, definitely the easiest way to go. As far as booting this thing, uh, we do use a UEFI firmware. Uh, you know, if you compare to something like QMU that can boot a Linux kernel directly, we actually go through the firmware first. Um, there's a little performance trade-off there, and maybe that's something we'll improve. Um, but essentially, this this init RD and the kernel are just sitting in the host file system. We we load them into address space, and off you go. We don't use grub. We just use the EFI stub loader from the Linux kernel. Um, and one thing that's kind of disappointing about this is that because we're loading a kernel and it gets decompressed, we can't actually share the memory for multiple VM instances. So, so each, each VM has its own copy of, of the kernel in memory. Uh, so this is something I, you know, I'd love to improve. It looks to me like the, the Linux kernel on AMD64 doesn't actually support an execute in place mode yet, but ARM, on ARM it does. So if anyone wants to come up and talk about that afterwards, I'd, I'd love to to get some thoughts on, on if that's something we could improve on. Um, so I kind of rushed through that because I wanted to get to um, I.O. So, so great, we can, we can boot this uh, VM. We, we know what we're running inside of it. But what about the two kind of tricky parts about containers, the networking and the storage? How, how do we get those into the container seamlessly and allow you to you know, use um, volumes and, and, and network options and all sorts of things in a way that makes sense. Uh, well, the good news for networking is that it's pretty straightforward. Uh, you know, if you look at a, a standard Linux or a shared kernel-based uh, Windows container, it basically works by creating a, some kind of virtual uh, network adapter uh, on the host and assigning it into a network namespace. And you know all the interesting parts of the networking really are happening on what is that on, on how that virtual adapter is hooked up to your host networks and, and things like that. So we're, whether you're using bridging or overlays or whatever, all the interesting stuff is really happening in the host. So for extending this to VMs, it's pretty straightforward. We just instead of a virtual NIC that pops up on the host, we just use standard uh, virtualized NIC over VM bus in our case. To, to expose that same network endpoint to, um, to the VM. And then once it's there, GCS can move that NIC into the network namespace uh, for the container, for the appropriate container. And it actually leaves the utility VM itself without any networking um, in kind of the initial namespace, the, the root, I guess root namespace. Uh, which is great because you don't want this utility VM to appear on your network. You don't want it to have to worry about an additional attack point in, uh, on your server or anything like that. So the utility VM can't accidentally uh, you know, interfere with your container's networking or anything like that. Of course, one side effect of this is it, it, this only works on cases where you would have assigned a virtual network uh, adapter to a namespace. So if you, if you were trying to, to a new namespace for that container. So if you want to share that namespace with, uh, with the host, if you want to share the host network namespace or you want to share a namespace between containers, that's obviously not going to work. We don't have a way to share the TCP stack between a host and a VM, especially a Windows host and a Linux VM. Um, and that's probably another good use case for if, you know, if we could support multiple containers in a single VM, at least then we could share the network namespace there. Um, so that, that's kind of, that we think, the best we can do. Uh, but if networking is easy, then storage is, is much trickier. There are a lot more questions about the right way to implement storage. And uh, the reason for this is that storage in VMs is, presents a few challenges. There's, you know, with, with standard containers, uh, with shared kernel containers, you can you essentially just need to get, if you want storage to be available to a container, you just need to get it onto the host somehow, get the host file system mounted, and we can use bind mounts or whatever to attach that storage into the, into the container. But with a VM, uh, and with a VM you can do that too. You can use something like SMB or uh, NFS or Plan 9, some kind of network file system to expose any file system that's on the host into a container, uh, into a VM, and then thus into a container, right? But this file-based approach has downsides. Uh, you know, the, 
every file system operation that has to go to the host it means extra latency for that operation, right? If, if with, with a shared kernel approach, it's just every file, every stat open, whatever, is just a syscall away. But if suddenly we have to go across the VM boundary, then, uh, you know, it's a full VM exit and, you know, a very expensive transition. So it's much more expensive than a syscall. And then also the, the kind of the network file systems in Linux or in Windows weren't really designed for this really low latency goal that we have, I think, um, you know, they kind of expect network latencies, not syscall latencies. So, uh, you know, even if that, the, the physics of going across to the, the host wasn't, weren't what they were, I think there'd still be some challenges. So then you have to start playing games with, well, do I really need to go to the host for every operation? Can I cache some things in the guest? And suddenly you start to lose some of the flexibility of, of having, um, you know, the, the files available on the host anyway, because if you cache things in the guest and they get modified in the guest, um, and then you try to read them from the host, that cache data may not be available and, and vice versa. So, so there's a lot of challenges around that. Um, and then, so, so at that point you say, well, at, why am I exposing host files to the guest at all? Can I just use, expose kind of the raw storage primitives? Can I expose a block device to the guest? Um, and just use file system, use the guest file system to interpret that block device, and that's great. You get you get better performance, you get uh, compatibility, but now you definitely can't share files between the host and the guest at the same time because it's really uh, the guest has complete control over that block device. So there are these trade-offs. Um, you know, are you okay with the extra latency? Are you okay with paying for these coherency issues or having these coherency issues? Um, are you okay with the kind of weird configuration of exposing a block device? Um, it really depends. And so what we tried to do for this first version is come up with kind of a sane set of compromises and to see how far we can get. And so this is definitely an area that, that I'm looking for feedback on what works well, uh, where should we you know, give some extra options, where should we just spend some time optimizing uh, to really make the, the storage solution um, you know, sufficient for all the different use cases out there. Uh, so, uh, and of course, I've been talking about storage generally, but we really can split this into two, uh, two sections. The first is, is the root file system for the container itself, uh, which, of course, in, in Docker, there's, on Linux, there's a bunch of different graph drivers, there are a bunch of different options for implementing this. We've chosen just one strategy for the first release. And it's based on the observation that at least with the root file system, you don't care too much about the host and the guest being able to access files concurrently. Um, you know, if you want to get files out of a container, you can use Docker CP, and we can enlighten that to actually call into the VM to pull the files out. We don't have to be able to access the files directly on the host. So what we came up with was kind of this block file hybrid uh, is the way I think about it. And essentially, we've, we... Uh, keep the layer concept of something like uh, AUFS or OverlayFS, but we expose these layers to the VM, uh, each as a separate um, persistent memory device that has an ext4 partition on it. And we for these read-only layers, we squeeze all the free space out of this, so this is minimally sized. And like I said, we expose this not as a traditional block device, but as a new persistent memory device, a PMEM device. And what that means is that this, the, the, in, if the guest wants to read from this device, instead of having to issue some kind of RPC call to the host to actually issue a, a device read, it just accesses uh, physical addresses. It, it basically, it's kind of, we've basically memory mapped that host file into the physical address space of the guest. And the cool thing about this is that the Linux kernel has added support for uh, direct access, or DAX, mode for ext4 partitions so that um, then when you go to memory map a file from that device into your process it doesn't use the page cache it doesn't do additional caching in the vm it just maps those physical pages directly into their process so if you're doing a read it's not going to go through the cache if you're doing mmap there's no additional caching so we're actually using the host's file cache uh, for for all of these files essentially and the nice thing about this is uh, we do get um, memory sharing between multiple containers. Even though we're using separate VMs for each container, if you're using the same image in multiple containers, we actually can share the, the cache and reduce overall memory footprint. 
Uh, then once we have all these layers, we just took the, the same approach that um, Docker defaults to, which is let's use the overlay file system and union these things together inside the VM. So we think that works pretty well. Um, the, what works slightly less well, but still I think uh, works, is, is the volumes and bind mounts. So for here, we basically said, uh, by default, we can't take a block approach. We can't take a, an approach that, that loses cache coherency with the host, or well, loses coherency with the host. We really need the files to be immediately available in the host and the container. So we have to take a file-based approach, and we have to do one that doesn't have a lot of extra caching. So what we did is we implemented the, uh, we, we used the Plan 9 file system, which is a network file system that's been available uh, in the Linux kernel for a while. Um, and we've used the mode that it's actually a, kind of a variant of the Plan 9 file system at this point. It, it's designed specifically for the Linux VFS model, the, the, the kind of protocol additions are. And we've implemented that over um, this uh, VM network transport called, in, in Linux, it's exposed to the address family VSOC. On the host side, uh, we actually have a different address family for interacting with the same thing called AF Hyper-V. But it's essentially the same thing. It gives us a, a network, you know, a stream uh, socket uh, to communicate between the guest and the host, and we've implemented this file system over it. Um, and then we had the problem of, well, how do we actually map the uh, Linux file system semantics onto the Windows file system? Because now I'm mounting, you know, by default, if I'm, I've got a volume or a bind mount, I'm just going to take a, some piece of an NTFS file system and map it into the, to the VM. Well, the cool thing is we've already solved this problem once uh, in the Windows subsystem for Linux. We have the same problem there. You want to be able to access your Windows files from Linux tools. So we've shared code here. We, we, we take, use the same uh, mechanisms that we use in WSL to expose, uh, to, to decide what Linux metadata to expose, how to respond to Linux operations. And you know, if you've used WSL a lot, you know that this isn't perfect yet. And it's not perfect in LCAL either. But now as WSL gets better, LCAL will get better and vice versa. So we're pretty, pretty proud that we could you know, use those, kind of bring these things, two things together in that way, even though the architectures are, are, are pretty different otherwise. Um, and like I mentioned, by default, well, actually it's hard coded right now that we, we disable any kind of caching in the, in the Linux guest around um, metadata um, especially, so that um, essentially every file system operation is going to have to go to the host. And this gives you correct behavior all the time. And I think what, what Docker's found with Docker for Mac is you know, they kind of had a similar problem where correct behavior is probably what you want most of the time, but it can be expensive. And so in Docker for Mac, they've implemented some options to allow you to weaken that coherency when you want to, to get better performance, when you know that the host isn't going to be modifying the files at the same time. We didn't expose that yet, but architecturally that seems pretty straightforward. So that's definitely something I think we'll, we'll uh, be thinking about for probably early on to address some of the, the performance issues. Um, but we have other ideas as well, so we're going to keep thinking about this space and, um, yeah, watch this space for more. So I'm going to end on a, a, a demo here on, on the storage bits, and um, we're going to go back first to our... Um, it's not working. There we go. Uh, we're going to go back to our non-cat guy here. All right, there we go. Um, and we're just going to go back to the utility VM. I just wanted to show the mount table for this thing. So non-cat is pretty sophisticated. It requires seven layers uh, to be implemented. And so you can see them all here. So each of these is um, one of these PMEM devices that I mentioned. You can see it's mounted read-only. Uh, which makes sense. And here's that DAX option that tells ext4, no, no, don't use the page cache, just map these pages directly through. Um, now I did uh, leave out one detail, which is that here we have actually still a SCSI device. So the writable portion, the writable layer uh, for our container root file system is currently a, a, a classic block device. Uh, we haven't quite figured out how to get that working with a, a, a PMEM device, but that's something that isn't as important anyway. You don't really need DAX, and you don't really need to avoid the page cache for the 
writable portion because that's not shared between containers anyway. And then here's that overlay mount where we've stitched together all these layers uh, into, into a single view. So that's great. And then let's, let's just show the volume stuff real quick. So the, um, da, da, da. all right. So essentially what I want to do is let's create a, uh, all right, we'll do, we'll do it live. Uh, so let's create a uh, Linux container with a volume called foo. Uh, we're just going to run it in the background here. And uh, I think this is kind of neat. Let's create another container, but this time let's create a Windows container. Let's map in the same volume. And what we're going to be able to do, we'll use Docker exec for this. What we're going to be able to do is, uh, you know, access the thing concurrently from both window, or Linux and Windows. So if we, you know, write a file to, uh, from the Linux side, so we've, here we've executed command in the Linux container to write into that volume. Now we can come back to our Windows container and we can actually view that file. So pretty cool volumes in, in both Windows and Linux at the same time. So with that, um, we can take some questions, but uh, I've got some more information here. I'll be tweeting out some of these links so you don't have to scramble to write them all down right now. You can follow me on uh, Twitter with Giga, at GigaStarks. Um, and, you know, we'd love to hear your feedback and, and we'd love for you to contribute as well. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. If you have questions, we have Microsoft microphones in the area, so please come to the microphone or raise your hand so I can come to you. Um, one question about uh, Docker Swarm mode. Is it also possible to run Linux and Windows containers when I create a, a Docker Swarm in it with my Windows 10 node? Uh, not yet. We haven't, um, you know, th there's some additional API changes in Docker to be able to expose this multi-platform mode. And I think that we'll want to make sure we get those completely merged before we kind of tackle the, the swarm uh, issues. But that's definitely, I think, something that would be very interesting to be able to do. Thanks for the talk. Uh, Thanks. I just have a quick question. Am I correct that I can try it on my Windows 10 laptop with latest updates? Yeah. So, so the, sorry, the question was, can you can you try this with the latest Windows 10? Yep. Yeah. So this, so actually on this laptop here, I'm running the the latest fall, the, what we call the fall creators update of Windows 10, which was released yesterday. Um, and so if you have the right um, version of the Docker daemon in the client, um, and you have Linux kernel and the Internet RD. If you have all, get all the pieces together, then yeah, absolutely. The platform support is there. Yeah, because uh, as I understand, uh, it was supported by only a new Windows Server version 17.09. And uh, so I didn't know about Windows 10. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, definitely. More question? <laughs> Uh, one question about multi-stage builds. Can I mix Windows and Linux with the, within the stages? No, it's a <laughs> For example, I mean, cross-compiling cross Golang binaries on Linux and then create a small nano server. It's not, no, it, it, I mean, it's not a bad idea at all. Um, so, so John Howard has been working hard on the Docker support for this. And he came to me uh, a few days before I left for the conference and said, you don't want to have multi-stage builds working for the conference, do you? Uh, it's definitely on our list, but it's, it's just a few steps down. So I have myself a question. Sure. Um, you mentioned multi-container support in one of those VMs, utility yeah. VMs. Do you think about pods? Yeah, I mean, these pods? that's certainly the, one of the motivations for, um, you know, one of the key motivations for supporting the, the multi-container 
uh, VMs because certainly the pause container, even if you didn't have anything else in your pod, just one container, you still need that pause container. Uh, so that's something we're definitely thinking about. Okay, thank you very much and um, have a good lunch and see you soon. Thank <clears throat> you.